continue continue the education meeting. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the purpose of the meeting today is to bring everybody up to date on uh, on un unlimited unlimited uh, continued education uh, licenses. The <clears throat> I think a couple of things that we want to just put on the record for housekeeping is that number one, the meeting is being recorded. Okay. Uh, number two, uh, when you are recognized to speak, uh, as Terry Jokes said much earlier to some people, please state your name, your address, and who you represent. Look, what, what firm you're representing, so we know that. And uh, the best way to get acknowledged uh, to speak is to raise your hand electronically. And I trust that everybody can do that. Uh, there's a little symbol at the bottom of the screen with, which says raise hand, which is what you would click on to do. And as soon as we can, we would get to everybody going through with questions. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we published on the BCP website, notified everybody of the uh, unlimited license curriculum uh, that's been developed by the by the board. And I, I first off I want to particularly thank the board members that have contributed a lot of hours and time into putting this together. Uh, it's just a very big task and it's bigger than normal because of the way we did it this year. Um, if you've already been on the DCP website, you should have seen that there is a, a part A, a part B, and a part C for, for, for the purposes of downloading. Uh, part A is basically the general application, which I'm going to have Terry uh, share with everybody so you can see it in the event uh, you don't have a copy in front of you. Um, and I'm going to go through that one first page by page. Um, when I get done with that, uh, I'll then take questions and answer questions uh, that anybody may have relative to this component. Then we're going to do part B, part C. Part B and part C, we're not going to go through every particular piece of it. We're going to go over the general uh, concept of it and you can ask questions on that at the end of each one. And for part B, I will call on uh, Paul Costello and for part C, Rich Bird, so to help out. So starting off, <clears throat> I'm gonna start page by page here uh, because as we see continued education applications come in, sometimes they're complete, sometimes they're not. And we're trying to get them to be as complete as possible. And uh, so I want to go through pretty much uh, some very specifics here. Now, if you notice on the, on the first page in red, it says that all provider applications shall be reviewed on a rolling basis. What that means is that we have <clears throat> taken away the deadline to have the continued education in. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, a lot of people were having trouble getting it in on time. Um, not to mention the fact that the COVID situation didn't help. Um, and actually, by statute and regulation, we, we, we never had anything specific in the statute of regulation that required a specific date on that. Um, that may change in the future, but um, just so everybody understands, okay? Other than that, the front page is very self-explanatory. Um, going on to the second page, um, this begins some of the real changes. Um, uh, number one, uh, at each, each continued education provider uh, application and curriculum is going to be now submitted on two thumb drives, okay? One thumb drive for each complete package. So we want two complete submittals submitted. Uh, and as it indicates there, those will be mailed to the address shown over Columbus Boulevard. Because, this, because this, 
the state is not totally back working 100% uh, full time over there. Um, we're going to be you're going to be mailing those in, and then those will be shared back out. Um, what what has happened last year during COVID and so forth, for the most part, uh, those were shared back out to me. I reviewed them all and and approved or commented on them accordingly. Um, because they come in in different periods of time, it's very difficult to get the board to get together. So uh, the department has said that they would take up more uncomfortable if I just approved, re reviewed them. So I did. Number two, uh, so to make it clear, we do not need any three ring binders anymore. Okay. Number two is even more important now doing this electronically that everything is indexed, okay? When you submit it on a thumb drive. So put it in, just as it says here, the application first, your certificate of insurance, and definitely make sure you verify the dates on that, that it's a, that it's a good insurance uh, certificate. Otherwise, it's gonna get sent back to you. Um, Besides that, it's just the normal things that you've already been submitting. So that hasn't changed too much. It's just the, 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 the means on how you, you're submitting it. Uh, we get down to the item number four. Um, license holders will be required to bring the code, the 2017 code. Okay, not, not much of a change there. Um, they're also going to definitely need to bring and have a functioning calculator with them. And you'll understand that why when we get into part B and C. Uh, we have no objection to the electronic version of the 2017. Uh, however, as you go to the next page, you'll see the bullets there, which identify what we need them to bring again. Uh, but cell phones are not an acceptable means of of uh, reading the code. It's too small. And candidly, between all of us providers, uh, you don't really know what they're doing on your cell phone. <laughs> and, and then the next thing you know, it's a little distraction. And it's hard on the provider to keep control of a class sometimes. Uh, so no cell phones in that regard, OK? Um, number five. Again, if you, if you need to add any training locations above and beyond what you originally submitted, um, you need to give us 60 days notice, okay? Uh, sometimes I know that happens too fast. Uh, most important thing is provide us notice and you send that into Karen and uh, she sends it right out to me and it's, we try to turn it right around the same day or two. Uh, just this hasn't changed, but it's just a reminder that uh, number six, the last sentence, uh, providers must retain copies of attendance sheets for four years after each course. Okay. So after anything beyond four years, uh, you do not need to keep. You're welcome to keep, but you don't need to. Um, number eight. Uh, PS, PSI reports, the transmittal of the uh, court, the attendees and whatnot, required to be done within 14 days of each completed course. Um, that hasn't changed really since last year either, but it's just another reminder. Um, and, and part of the reason that's so important is as we get further into the year, we try to gauge what percentage of people have been have taken continued ed and how many have not, and uh, based on the uh, things happening within the state, be it COVID or what have you, uh, we may need to do something to help push that along, either through reminders or what have you, but, uh, but please get that in within 15, 14 days.
once your program is approved and you get a you you, you get a a notification that it's been approved, okay. Um, you're still going to be required to put a handbook out to each attendee, and a copy of that is is needed, okay, to be submitted to the Department of Consumer Protection. Even though you're going to have it in the electronic version, uh, the department feels the need to have the hard copy. Um, there was some discussion about doing the entire program as a hard copy. And um, I said, you know, as long as you got the handout book, that's fine because they don't have any room up there for all this paperwork and what have you. So. It makes a lot more work on everybody else's part. It's not necessary. So we don't have to do that. Just just send in the bound attendee handout. Next page is the standard fire uh, marshal certificate. Uh, nothing changes there. We're all familiar with that. That's part of this year submittal. The, the very next page is the evaluation form that the attendee fills out and mails into the department. Uh, that gives us an idea on how well the classes are going, any problems. Uh, and yes, we, we get some very interesting comments like, you know, they didn't have the right kind of donuts. They didn't have <laughs> the, the, the so, you know, the soda was warm, you know, you, you know but you always get, some of those um and we we do look at these when they come in so uh but the student or the attendee is the one that's what we've got to send this in not you the provider okay <clears throat> going to the next page uh terry okay um it, right up on top in big red letters okay bold okay the contents of the following curriculum outline shall not be copied in whole or in part for any purpose other than to be used in this program. The developer of this program takes no responsibility for any typographical, technical, or PowerPoint errors uh, should they exist. To disclaimer our, on our part, because we put a lot of stuff together, at the same token, we're telling you, don't take and utilize part of our PowerPoint for some other venture you might be doing, okay? It's just designed for our program and we don't wanna hear that's used elsewhere or there'll be some possible ramifications. So now we get into the real curriculum, okay? Um, what we've done here is, um, as you know, we got part, uh, part one and part two as we call it, but part one, uh, I want to go over a little bit with everybody here. Uh, part one, uh, we're, we're allowing or we're assigning an hour of time to cover this material, okay? Now, you might go an hour and 15 minutes, you might go 45 minutes. Every class will be a little bit different because of people's uh, questions and responses. Uh, but we're trying to keep it to about an hour. Now, I, I visited a number of classes, I, I, particularly during uh, COVID, those that were online, uh, and people didn't get the point here of what we were saying. And it's spelled out just the way it is here. And if you see, it says Connecticut General Statutes and Regulations, that section, okay? And then in parentheses, the second line down, one second line further down, uh, Terry. It says in parentheses, it says classroom review not required. Okay. <clears throat> we want this material available to them in front of them so they keep being reminded of it. Year after year, uh, the providers have explained this stuff over and over again to everybody. And after a while, it gets tiring for everybody. So, by all means, if you got somebody's got a question about it, respond to them, but you do not have to get into any details um, uh, as far as we're concerned relative to any of these uh, 
statutes and regulations, except for a couple that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, Terry, uh, the you, you it went down to sharing. Can you bring it back up? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, if you notice, uh, bullet number two, section twenty dash three thirty two b, hiring ratios. Uh, there's an exhibit attached here, which basically is the ratio as it stands today. And you want to make sure that people keep understanding that. Yeah, let's look further down, Terry. Keep going. Keep going. Right there. Okay. And we we put the statute in and so forth for everybody so they have it. Um, so it's there. People get confused. How many apprentices can I have now when I have this number, meant a number of journeymen? Uh, it's, it's spelled out right here. Okay, we go back to where we were up on the... Okay. So, as I said, no need to go to over each one of those sections, okay? But include them in the, hand, in the handout. There's a couple of new or changed regulations which uh, came about this year, <clears throat> which we felt were important to bring to everybody's attention because unfortunately, people aren't always notified of some of these changes and that's part of the objective of continued education uh, is to keep people up to date. Um, and the first one I want to talk about is uh, public, public, yeah, public Act 21-37. And you can roll down to the next, to that public act, okay? Now, Public Act 21-37 uh, is entitled, which can be confusing to some people, an act concerning Department of Consumer Protection Licensing and Enforcement, comma. So that's the subject by itself. Then antitrust issues and the palliative use of marijuana and revisions to the Liquor Control Act. So people sometimes rewrite by all this uh, part about the licensing and enforcement. And they say, well, it's about marijuana and liquor and I, I got nothing to do with that. So it doesn't apply to me. However, we took the sections out of the bill um, that were critical to our industry. Uh, in section 16 of the bill, uh, refers to this section 21A10 of the general statutes and it's repealed and the following is substituted. This is also important that it went into effect October 1st of this year. And I'm sure a number of providers are gonna say, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And I don't blame you because you, there's probably no reason why you would know that. <laughs> uh, and it, we go right to the changes that were made. So if you go down to C, Terry, Section C was added, okay? And it says, for any Department of Consumer Protection license, certificate, registration, or permit that requires the holder to complete continued education requirements, the continued education requirements shall be completed within the annual or biannual period that begins and ends three months prior to the renewal date of the applicable license, certificate, registration, or permit except for licenses issued pursuant to chapter 400J. Our licenses are, are issued under chapter 393, okay? Uh, this is a, a broad stroke statement uh, regarding continued edu education requirement before renewal of a license. Uh, they talk about annual or biannual. Uh, the plumbers, for example, are biannual. Uh, uh, we, as electrical people, are annual. Um, this also re addresses people such as uh, the realtors uh, require continued education and any, anybody else that has a license issued through the Department of Consumer Protection that has continued education requirements attached to it. So right off the bat, um, our, our licenses expire on September 30th. So Back it up three months 
and that's when the continued education is supposed to be completed. Okay. I know everybody's saying to themselves, how, how can we possibly do that? <clears throat> um, you, well, you can't. <laughs> you, you really can't. Uh, <clears throat> as time goes on, <clears throat> we will be adjusting the continued education so that we can comply with this. But the first time this is in effect, which is Oct October of 2021, this year, pa past uh, October, uh we're not able to do we're not able to do this uh, so bear in mind that this is there um if people don't have their continued education done already <laughs> uh i don't suspect there's going to be any action taken at this point i uh, had discussions with the commissioner um about this and we all are on pretty good understanding that that's what the law says uh, but by the same token, we realize the reality of the time frame and, and where we are today. So that's coming down the pike. It's there right now. It's the law, and it will. We're going to start trying to adjust our continued ed. Um, and at some point, you're going to be doing some. You'll be doing continued ed. And you'll be doing the following years almost on top of the other one in order to get in line. Um, how we're going to do that, right? yeah, we don't know. The other change that happened under uh, that public act is uh, section 23, which is, it's a new section. Um, it's a new section in that uh, the items I have highlighted are new. And this goes into effect January 1st, 2022. Um, uh, but it's important that you, you educate all the attendees to this entire um, section, okay? Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go through it. I'm gonna take the time to do it because I think it's important. That no contractor perform work on a private residence as defined in section 2419 of the general statutes by a contractor license pursuant to chapter 393, which we are, of the, of the general statutes, or any person who owns or controls a business engaged to provide the work or services licensed under the provision of this, of said chapter by persons licensed for such work, shall be valid for enforcements against an owner as defined in section 2419 of the general statute, unless the following takes place. This has always been pretty much the case that it's in writing, you have a contract in writing. It's signed by both the owner and uh, the contractor. It contains the entire agreement between both parties. Uh, it contains the date of the transaction, uh, contains the name and address of the contractor and the contractor's license number, or in the case of a business, the name of the business owner, partner, or limited liability member and phone number. Um, an address of business, partnership, or limited liability. Uh, this is new. We'll talk about this a little bit. Number six uh, contains the name and license number of any licensees performing the work provided the name and the license number of a licensee may be amended in writing during the term of the contract. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Seven contains a notice of the owner's cancellation rights in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 740 and contains a starting date and a completion date. I think everybody knows that contract's not valid unless you have a uh, starting and completion date in any event. But going back to number six, um, what, that, what that says is, in, in essence, is um, contractor goes out to uh, Terry's house to do a job. Uh, and he uh, met all these requirements uh, as stipulated, and he sends um, Joe uh, to, 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 to work on her kitchen remodeling, let's say. And Joe goes in and does some rough wiring, pre-wiring, what have you. Um, Joe's name and license number 
uh, needs to be listed on that contract. Um, now it's time to come back and finish Terry's uh, kitchen remodel. And um, George gets sent over to do the finish. Well, George's name has to go down on the contract as well. So any, any person who is working on that job, and bear in mind, these are private residences. So this does not apply to commercial work, okay? Um, their names need to be listed on the, in that contract, okay? Now, like I said, when I get done, I'll come back to any of these items. And some items I'll have an explanation for, some I won't. <laughs> The next next one, if Terry will go down, is uh, Public Act 21-154. Uh, it's an act codifying prevailing wage contract rates. And I'm not gonna read this entire thing um, to everybody, but basically what it's, it's saying is that uh, the Department of Labor Commissioner will establish the rate for a particular project. Now, typically we see that published and it appears that it falls in line with the um, union's uh, rate of pay and what have you. However, this goes one step further and says um, it's also relative to the prevailing rate in that particular town where this work is being done. So it could be higher, it could be lower. I've heard recently of a project uh, in one part of the state where the published rate was X, but then when the prevailing rate, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, reports were submitted from the contractor, uh, he found out that it was actually something higher uh, because uh, because of this law. So I'll let you just read it. I'm not going to try to interpret it from a labor department standpoint. Uh, but if you have have any questions, um, feel free to give me a call. I'll try to push you in the right direction. I try to get an answer. Um, after that, she was the, uh, was the, uh, keep going, Terry, <clears throat> was the uh, exhibit A, and you can keep scrolling down, we already looked at that, and this is 20-332, which established a uh, working group uh, to, that's studying the, the, the hiring ratio in, uh, racial relief um, that was developed back in 2017. Um, and you go one more down. Keep going to you get to 2018 building code. There we go, right there. And then the state building code again in parentheses. This is to be included in all courts handouts to attendees for the use for the future use. Um, it lists the state building codes that we are under today. We don't work just under the NEC. We do predominantly, but we, it's not the only code that it may uh, affect us. And they need to know that. And they can always refer to the state building officials website uh, for any of the more currently adopted codes based on when they refer back to this. Code document. Now the next section is going to be safety and before we get into that, okay, uh, I'm going to ask bravely if anybody has any questions. <laughs> uh, let's see. Mr. Bonder, Rob Bonder. Yes, sir. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon, I mean. How are you? Good, thank you. 
You had your hand up. Did you have a question? I did not have my hand up. Oh, man. I'm just listen, listening intently. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Believe it or not, that was my icon that landed over your name. <laughs> sorry about that. It's all right. Okay. Um, Good to see else? you, though. Good to see you. Yeah, same here. Uh, is there anybody that has any questions about the front end, the front end of this? Uh, Mark Candells, your hand is up. Yes, it is. Uh, Mark Candells, uh, Candells Estimating and Training, uh, Babcock Ranch, Florida. Uh, I had one question in regards to the September 30th date. Um, as a suggestion, maybe we should suggest to our attendees this year that saying, hey, you've got to get it done for July 30th. Um, that'd be the best bet to you know, start thinking about it, getting it done. Would, would the state like that done? Added to the curriculum? I mean, you, you can certainly suggest that. I think have to, I think we see a lot of people that wait to the last minute to do it. That's 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 goes without saying because we look at the numbers of who has and who hasn't taken it. Um, but I think by bringing that uh, one public act up to them and explaining to them that look, you're going to have to start picking up picking up your speed here and get stuff done. Um, is, is hopefully would be adequate. I would not say on behalf of the state of Connecticut that uh, we're making that requirement, but the law is the law now, and uh, don't wait till they start having to enforce it in the department. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the question. Anybody else? Okay. All right. So. Our, the next section here is what we reference as part B on the website to create a download. And uh, I, I just want to explain to everybody what we've done here is um, we, there's been a lot of cry, uh, um, a lot of people asking for more and more calculations and more understanding and more technical stuff. So. What we've done is we have put together, I say we, the, 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 uh, the team, uh, and Paul Costello has led it relative to the safety side in particular. Um, the, this, 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 the portion that we want to talk about relative to safety. Now, bear in mind, this is all part of the one hour presentation. Um, and that's why I say everything I went through before, a lot of that is just keep it in the books, let them make sure they're aware of it, use it as reference for them to keep in reference material. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn this over to Paul in just a second, but the purpose of us doing this is to do what, just what Jim Savoy said very earlier before we went online, is that everybody is being taught exactly the same thing, okay? Um, and we are not looking to see any waiver from our presentations here. So, um, Paul, if you would be so kind to give me a break and do the honors. Sure, thank you, Larry. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so one of the things that we discussed, we, we try to figure out you know from previous classes you know what direction to head with some of the topics and things that we discussed were really identifying some of the issues with osha with citations and the need to um, really bring in the electrical safety uh, as nfpa 70 e has been updated as well to the 21 version so um terry joe either or if you want i could share my screen or you want me to uh Sure, if you think that you'll have more control over what you're saying from your screen, that's not a problem. It's up to you, yeah. whichever might... one you're more comfortable with. I can yeah. give you permission now. That'll be um, perfect, thank you. Let me change over the permissions. And you should be able to present. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. One second here. There you go. Very good. 
Yes, that's the, I believe that's that's part one. Yep. That's yep. Correct. Okay, you are seeing it. Great. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Good job, Thank Paul. You. Okay. Good I got too many monitors running here. Okay. So what we identified were the uh, top 10 violations cited by OSHA in 2020. And as always, falls number one. So you'll notice on each of the slides, what I try to do is make a reference to which standard we're referencing. So in this case, the citations and the reference is going to be to 1926, the construction standard, and then each of the subparts. Um, HASCOM, 1910, general industry. Respiratory, again, um, looking at some of the issues we've seen over the last two years now dealing with COVID, references to gen industry, 1910 as well. Scaffolding, uh, 1926 standard. Ladder safety, again, with construction. Hazardous energy, lockout, tagout. Um, lockout, tagout will be a, a topic that we're going to cover in a little more detail. But again, bringing it in from the 1910 side. Same thing with powered industrial trucks. Fall protection, uh, construction standard. Eye protection, construction. And guarding for machinery. Um, 1910. So from there, what we wanted to do was, because ultimately we were going to lead into um, electrical safety in the workplace, 70E, and one of the requirements is going to be putting equipment into an electrically safe work condition and cover on lockout, tagout. So we make some references here to 1910, 1926, and just kind of remind everyone that, you know, we typically focus on the electrical side as our industry, but there are other sources of energy that we got to take into account. And then also bring in uh, Article 120 in NFPA 70E that really spells out electrical safety or um, putting something into an electrically safe work condition, lockout, tagout, and then make reference to the annex. There, there won't be a need to have the participants um, come in with 70E. Uh, further in the slide, you'll see any of the NFPA documents, as everyone knows, is available online. So they could just view it uh, through the online version during the class if need be. Uh, make some references to the different uh, definitions that we'll talk about. Reiterate who's responsible, both the qualified and the non-qualified persons working. Employers, employees. And then the training requirements as far as the employer's responsibilities. Uh, the reasons that we got to basically train the um, affected employees or the, we'll call it say in-house employees to make sure that they're not energizing something and bypassing anything that we put on it. And then we get into the sequence for a lockout tag out. Reviewing the drawings. And all this will be part of a, an exercise a little later in the presentation. Uh, looking at the references to lockout tagout in um, Article 120. And then just remind everyone that they are using the proper category rated test equipment while they're verifying for the absence of the voltage. Uh, just kind of remind everyone about the general requirements. Um, need to put things into an electrically safe work condition unless it's unfeasible. And today that's really difficult. Um, but more important that we remind them that in order to test to make sure something is de-energized, they do require to be suited up properly. some of the references to um, Article 130 and the tables. Selecting the proper PPE. Just going more through the lockout tagout sequence. Do a live dead live test. So they're testing their test equipment before they actually do any testing on the, uh, the source. Make sure that test equipment's working properly. And then talk a little about the OSHA requirements for tags on the equipment. Get into a little bit with um, group lockout tagout or complex lockout tagout on a larger site. 
where you may have multiple trades working on something or more than one electrician. And then now we're bringing the equipment back up. So basically we're gonna reverse the process. So now getting more into the 70E side of it and the task, um, just kind of go through 70E because for some it might be a little new to them. Some of the general requirements. Talk again about the infeasibility. And it really comes down to the troubleshooting. So now we get into the, the risk assessment side of it. Um, arc flash risk assessment, identify the arc flash hazards, likelihood of occurrence, and then select the proper PPE. And really comes down to two methods. We could either use a table method or we can use the incident energy. And too many times uh, from classes, everybody automatically goes to the tables, but they don't always verify that the tables can be used because of the, um, they really don't do the calculations to determine if it's permitted. Uh, one of the things in probably the last two updates to 70, I think it was back to about 2015 or so, it basically tells you that you could do it by one of the two methods, but you can't use both. So if you're using the category method, then you make your selection on your PPE. If you're using the incident energy, you cannot use the tables basically to make your selection. You have to base it on the incident energy. Um, this is the reference to being able to view the down um, 70 document online to so get it from there. And within the packet, there'll be some we call it an appendix, some additional information to be able to do the calculations and walk through it. So there's going to be some one-line diagrams for them to reference, panel schedules, feeder schedules, arc flash study report, the labels of the equipment. So really what the intent is, they're going to have, um, again, just go through each one, pictorial of the one line, traditional one line, different equipment, panel schedules, feeder and branch circuit schedule, because we'll have to take into account the conductor uh, and the length of the conductor when we do our calculations, for instance, in energy, transformer schedule, duty report. You know, some of these um, within the appendix won't actually be required for the calculations, but it would be part of a typical arc flash study report. And probably one of the more important ones are the labels on the equipment itself. Uh, included the C, uh, values as we get into the calculations. So you'll see that coming up. So really what we're looking at is we break it down to a couple of tasks. Um, looking to add a new panel board gives us where it's going to be located. It's going to be... Um, coming out of installation of LP1 requires on a transformer to a high voltage panel, HP1. Then we give them two scenarios, select the proper arc flash PP using the incident energy analysis method. Um, that's applying the rules in 135G or the second option is gonna be kind of a comparison to see where we have a higher uh, incident energy based on either the table or the true incident energy. Uh, if we go with the table method, then we're gonna be working with 137C15. So we gotta put it into an electrically safe work condition. So now we're gonna require them to start either looking at one lines to determine where it's fed from or go back to the, the panel schedule. So we give them that information. Um, then now we got the label of the equipment. So it tells us um, what our voltage is, what our limited approach, restricted approach, and it also gives us our incident energy. Uh, select in the proper PPE now. So we get our gloves. That's a new one, 70. E.
Uh, set up our boundaries, again, based off the labels. So now we're doing the table method. And we're looking at the incident energy. So we could find it a couple of different places. We can get it off the actual ARCS flash report. Uh, in addition to the label that's on the equipment itself. In this case, this is panel HP1 that we're working on. So that's where we're going to perform the lockout tag out. Now we revert back to our table and we make our selection based on the incident energy. So again, now we bring them into the table method. Uh, based off of the labels on the equipment, and then they will make their selection from there. Looking at the second scenario, we're now, in order to use a table, we have to validate um, what our short circuit current available is. So we go through the process doing our calculations now looking at the source to start with, starting from the transformer. Um, determine what the impedance of the transformer is, get our multiplier. And now what we're doing is we're breaking down the circuit, looking at the one line diagram based in the fault current at each location throughout the, the system. Again, the feeder schedule is important. We got to remember that we got parallel feeders with four conductors of 600 circular mil. So the raceway is important. We're going to be in steel conduit. Um, we base it on the conductor of those 600s. So we get our C value. Again, we got to remind them that we have parallel, so that's where the four comes in. So the N represents the number of conductors. And then again, just break it down further into the system. So really what we're looking to do is basically validate that we're permitted to use the table. Um, too many times people ask, can we just automatically go to the table without actually knowing it? And the second from last slide just kind of shows a comparison of the two different methods um, using the incident energy compared to the more conservative category method that's going to be done on the labeling. So the true incident energy after we had the arc flash study was only 0.2 cal where we're assuming it could be up to an ACAL permitted by the um, category method. Short circuit current available, um, the true from the software that was used to do the uh, arc flash study compared to the calculation. So it's you know probably within about 10% or so. Okay. So any questions or? Yeah, Paul, no, it's uh, a lot of information. Yeah, I, I just want to tag on to that for a minute, and then I see there are I see at least one question. Um, the and, and, and that's, that's correct. There's a lot of information there. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to say, "I don't need to know any about of that. I I just do it this way." Okay, and it's and I've been doing it this way for years, and I'm you know, I never got hurt. Well, they're they're very fortunate. Fact of the matter is, this information is available, and we want to make it available to them so that they have the opportunity of uh, knowing how to calculate this information um, for their own safety. And as that last, second to the last slide showed, um, there's a big difference. For, I think it was point two compared to, to eight, right? Eight pounds, yeah. Yeah, um, significant. It was very significant. So. Um, with that, um, Peter, uh, actually Jim Savoy has his hand up. Jim? Jim, you're on mute. 
There we go. And better? Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just curious how deep um, in this year's cycle uh, are we expected or required to go um, having um, taught OSHA for a very long time? Um, this could take up a whole day if, uh, you know, if we did every slide. I'm just curious, is there a, a line at which uh, the board would like us to say, uh, do up to slide 50 or up whatever? I, I think it's, I, I would, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, from your standpoint too. I think, uh, yeah, it would take a long time to go through a complete uh, calculation, okay? I think the idea is that we have the examples here for them. They need to know about it. Um, and I think the importance of doing it was shown on the second to the last slide, slide okay? The, the, the difference differentials between two, uh, two methods. And it's for their own safety. I mean, they're gonna certainly want to have their, those examples could have been reversed even. Uh, they certainly want to have the right uh, type of PPE on uh, and choose the right, right type. Uh, it's also difficult uh, for, I think, uh, some instructors may not understand this, uh, but you've got to take the time to go through it and, and, and do the best you can. Uh, that's why when the email went out, we asked that uh, somebody technical would be involved in today's pre uh, attendance. Um, so uh, I don't know if that answers your question, um, Jim. Um, yes and no. Um, can we check? We're not, we're not, I mean, we're not saying go to slide 42 and stop. Yeah, I, okay, that's better. And the other thing, maybe um, Paul can clarify this. <clears throat> Pardon. Pardon my voice, I'm still recovering from cancer. Um, can we cherry pick important uh, items um, so that we can spend time on the calculations? Say, uh, uh, you know, just kind of breeze through uh, ladder safety and, uh, you know, the basic OSHA um, and then get down to the meat and potatoes of 70E lockout tag out and the, uh, the uh, incident energy arc flash calculations. Would that be acceptable? I would, well, I, mean, I would say yes. I mean, case in point, the example you made, ladder safety, whatnot. I mean, we've been preaching that for a number of years. Um, and uh, try not to keep this make this program just be a repeat of, of the same thing year after year. So we're trying to expand the program. So to answer your question, yeah, you can certainly skip that. Bear in mind, we've only, we've only allocated an hour, okay, between what Paul just showed you and uh, some of the statutes and regulations, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, Mr. Oh, Mr. Chairman, Rich Bird. Yeah, Rich. I, I think, you know, some of the confusion and Paul, um, if you, if, if you're, uh, if you, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the intent of the subcommittee was to really um, show a good review of exactly uh, NFPA 70E um, and, you know, where, where these calculations come from and where this information comes from. Um, and you, you know, the second to the last slide really, really shows the importance of understanding that in that review. And, you know, as a subcommittee, I think that's what we were, we were trying to do to get that point across is to understand where these calculations come from. Yeah, I agree, Rich. And to also kind of reiterate also kind of familiar with, you know, where do they find that information? You know, probably the most important thing is the lockout tag out uh, to be able to look at the one line diagrams, look at panel schedules and determine, you know, what equipment is needs to be put into an electrically safe work condition as well. Correct. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Royce had, I see your hand might have gone up and then uh, then Jerry down at the room. Royce. Uh, yeah, I just had a uh, 
question on the calculations in this section. And I just want to make sure the intent is not that we're giving these to the um, the people in the class as a calculation that they need to figure out, but we're giving them the information of how to figure it out. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We want them to understand how to how how you do it, and this is the this is the roadmap, if you will. Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't like the calculations in previous years where we say, here's a scenario, somebody give me the answer. Um, because like somebody else mentioned, this is the first time that a lot of these people are gonna have seen anything like this. Yeah, yeah. a lot of them don't even, I mean, depending on what their work experience is, uh, have no, no knowledge. They don't even know 70E exists. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's just super important from a safety standpoint. Um, uh, Jerry? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Jerry Durham here, the instructor and content developer with Jade Learning. Uh, Royce did a very good job of addressing most of what I uh, was concerned with. And really, it seems like uh, I'm getting uh, overall a picture of what, you're, what you all are expecting. Um, normally, I don't sit in on these meetings, but, you know, you all had specified, but it was my understanding that the safety portion, OSHA specifically, and the understanding that 70E is a response to OSHA from the NFPA to try and make, uh, make you know, uh, compliance available to the electrician, that this training looked like it was going to be about an hour. I thought I heard you say that. Then we went through those 90 slides, of course. And I realized I was looking at what amounted to probably an eight hour course. And I still would have lost a lot of the guys in there because as a lot of you all pointed out, uh, these residential and commercial electricians, they have no experience with this. They don't know what a available fault current is versus short circuit current rating and all that. And even the terms, they would never get up to speed with that. But it sounds like, and I appreciate it now, if you'll just uh, let me know that I'm on the right track. And it sounds like that our job essentially is to let them know how dangerous it is what they're doing and to understand that there, you know, there are uh, the, obviously the, the PPE requirements and the uh, clearances and, and the, it, the, the distance they need to stay away uh, based on how they're dressed and, and what provisions they're taking, where the information is, uh, and you may a cursory review of that to show them that it exists but not to work the calculation, as Royce just said. So I think he, he caught that. But uh, it sounds like we're really going to, we spent 20 minutes looking at those slides and we didn't even have time to look at them. So if we've got 60 minutes, we literally are going to be moving at a blinding speed. So it sounds like we're just going to be like, hey, this exists, here it is. Uh, you need to know this is here and you need to get deeper into it as electricians and whatever we can do in about 60 minutes and then we're out. <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> That's pretty much it, uh, Jerry, yes. Um, you know, years ago, the fault currents that are available today really weren't there, okay? Uh, you know, the what the utilities are providing today uh, and the exposure that we as electricians have is, is substantially different. And, you know, we want to make sure that everybody work safe and understands how to work safe and understands that, you know, maybe I don't know how to do that, but I do know a little bit about it. I've heard about it. Um, I give you a, a, a sort of an example. Um, you know, our license is an unlimited license. We can do high voltage work. Okay. Very few license holders with unlimited license will do high voltage work because it's not something they do day to day, but they're aware of it. And they know that if they come across it, they can at least recognize it, hopefully, and know that, you know, this is a little bit beyond what I normally do. And maybe I need to talk to a friendly competitor or somebody else uh, to, to get some guidance here. So, yeah, it's, it's, we're, we're not trying to make them engineers out of uh, out of these presentations, that's for sure. And it would be a good eight hour course. I, I agree, Jerry. And yes, um, there'd be a lot of snoring going on in that class. <laughs> well, fantastic. Uh, it sounds like, I feel like that you 
uh, summarize the whole thing. And that is to get these guys within an hour's time to be aware that they need to hit the brakes when they run into these kind of situations and don't just uh, go through at a blinding speed like they're used to doing because this stuff will kill them. They need to be aware of that and uh, be aware that the doc, you know, the documentation exists and the help is out there. So uh, fantastic. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to uh, being able to present that uh, material this year. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, you're welcome, Jerry. Thanks. Just stay on board because we've got one more to go. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think the, the, it is very highly technical and, the, and, you know, even the labeling of equipment today is something that didn't exist years back and people all of a sudden see these labels and they say, oh, what's that all about? I don't know what that's all about. I don't, I don't have to, that's a manufacturer's label. I don't know what it's, it's got nothing to do with me. I just got to tie this wire in over here <laughs> and hopefully be safe. So a lot of it's awareness. So again, Paul, thank you for your, your presentation and your, uh, your information and you know, all your hard work and on our team to get this put together. Uh, and again, as I said earlier on, for anybody that came in a little bit late, um, none of this material is to be reproduced uh, other than for our program here. Uh, so don't utilize any part of it or anything for anything else. It's, it's designed for us. Uh, the next would be our what we call part two, which are three, is a three hour presentation. And again, as I said earlier, a number of people it asks for more and more calculations. Uh, and uh, these are the calculations that most of them are, will recognize a little bit more than the safety side of it. Um, and, and for that, I'm gonna ask uh, um, board member Rich Bird to uh, make that presentation. Uh, again, Rich is part of the team developing this. And I see you've got control, Rich, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually working remotely, Mr. Chairman. So if um, if Terry, Joe, if you don't mind. Um, Will do, Rich. Thank you. Okay, and it's up now. Can you see the screen at all, Rich? Um, it should be up uh, now. Starting yeah. to come up now. Yep. Up now, yep. Right. Yep. So basically, and first of all, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for attending. Um, like uh, Paul said earlier, um, you know, the subcommittee put together um, here uh, some chapter specific um, calculations and we tried to break them down specifically by chapter. So here we start off with chapter one. If you don't mind, Terry, go on to the next slide. So here what we have is uh, Article 110.14c talking about temper temperature limitations. All right. And what we have put in here is a scenario. And um, you, there uh, is the uh, code article 110, 114CA2 uh, 110 talks about the temperature limitations of equipment. And here we broke it out. Okay, thank you, Terry Joe. Can you can we move on? So and then what we've done is the next slide is give is presented you with the calculation and the answer uh, to that particular calculation. So in the scenario here, what you can see is we put together the uh, scenario based on a number two THHN aluminum conductor, the breaker at 60 degrees. Uh, the breaker is listed for copper and aluminum conductors. And it said, what would be the allowable ampacity? And we have completed that calculation here based on the NEC. Thank you, Terry Joe. We can move on. All right, uh, section two, what we here, have here, is we put the, this, the, the same thing together, but here in this scenario, you can see that it is greater than 100 amps. So now we are gonna to go to B2 to talk about um, that particular scenario. And there's the little indication or the little uh, code um, requirement for uh, uh, 110.14C1B2. And I can see uh, after review, uh, there is one little typo there. It should say 110.14C1B2, not uh, 114. So again, one quick little little scenario, which <laughs> after all our review, 
I, I see one little, one little, one little typo. Oh, All funny. right. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go back, Terry Joe, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so basically what we've tried to do is give the question. So if we can go one more slide, Terry Joe, if you don't mind. So here is the question that we would put up on the slide. Let them, let them work it out, work them through it. And then the next slide will give you the, um, the answer and how that calculation is determined. All right, thank you, Terry Joe. And we can continue on. Uh, question number three here, we have, uh, here we're talking about uh, conductors all in the same raceway. Uh, and determining uh, what the D rating percentage uh, for the current carrying conductors or more than three current carrying conductors in a, in a conduit would be. And again, what we did is put the question up on the slide. Okay, and then the, the, pre, the, the slide uh, right next, right after it, there's the code section. And then the slide right after would give you the, the answers uh, and how that calculation is to be performed. Basically, that's the way we have it set up for through the whole presentation here. All right. Thank you, Terry Joe. We'll continue on with chapter one here. Here we're talking about uh, working clearances. So we put together some scenarios here based on working clearances. All right. Uh, we've got a little panel board schedule and a, le a little schedule legend here, more just describing what the panel board is and the voltages so that we can properly do the calculations. So Terry Joe, if you don't mind backing out a little bit. So what we're just looking here for is uh, panel board uh, HP1 and what condition and what is the minimum working, minimum working clearance uh, for panel H1, HP1 rather, I'm sorry. So as we scroll through the next slide will give us the, uh, the, the working clearances and the condition that we're looking for. Okay. And yep, thank you, Terry Joe. We do have a few, we do have a few other scenarios uh, under working clearances. And here it is under question two. Same, same looking at panel HP1 again, just reversing it here, now doing it against the block wall to determine what the condition would be. And again, what you'll be able to see is the, the panel voltages. And again, what we're looking for is the condition and the working clearance based on the condition in this particular scenario. And here we have, we can see that uh, because that panel went from that sheetrock wall to the concrete wall, what we've done is change the condition and the working clearance. So thank you, Terry Joe. Here, here now we've again brought the scenario up. We've got, uh, panels panels on both sides and uh, live parts on both sides. So now we got to look at the, what the clearances would be on here. Again, the panel voltages. So looking at that particular question, we're looking at what panel HP1 falls under, what condition that would be, and again, what the working clearance would be for that particular panel. And here again, based on that, that, that particular uh, scenario, you can see that the condition and the working clearance again now um, has changed based on the, the, the particular uh, condition number. Okay, thank you, Terry Joe. And again, now we're looking at uh, HP2 and what we're looking at here. And again, we'll go through the same, same kind of thing We'll speed this up a little bit just so they're just basically looking at what the different conditions are and the changes to the conditions based on uh, the scenarios that are going through here. Okay. And again, we go back to the condition that we got right here. Okay, moving forward, chapter two. Basically, all we're looking at here is again determining what uh, in a dwelling unit the number of receptacles required. So we'll just kind of go through that quickly. Okay, thank you. All right, and based on uh, 210.52A1 and A2, you can see the correct number of receptacles would be six. Okay. Okay, uh, moving into, uh, again, moving into just a, a few calculations here based on uh, the wall ovens. 
and tap conductors. Okay, thank you, Terry Joe. And again, moving forward, what we have here is the uh, the <clears throat> excuse me the code section and uh, the exception uh, to make sure that we pick up exception number one here. All right, thank you. Again, more more with the uh, kitchen uh, kitchen uh, cooking equipment in a dwelling unit. Thank you, Terry Joe. Fixed appliances, talking a little bit about fixed appliances here in under uh, chapter two. Very good, thank you. Uh, lighting loads now for calculations. For 620, this would be an article 220. So you picked, you see we picked up uh, article 210, 220. Thank you, Terry Joe. Again, another one under your lighting load, general lighting loads under Article 220. Same kind of thing here. What we're looking for is the lighting and re feeder, the receptacle feeder uh, calculation or demand on, on, uh, on the building. Okay. Here we have a warehouse. Again, you're looking for the lighting demand according to Article 220. Thank you, Terry Joe. All right, uh, now we're getting into uh, grounding. All right, uh, minimum size uh, equipment grounding conductors in Article 250 here. So the focus here is to do 250, 250 66, 250-102-C, and uh, 250-122. So as we go through here, you'll see that uh, we're doing 250-66. Okay. Thank you very much, Terry Joe. I believe we have a, a another one here. Yeah. Now we're talking about uh, two fifty one twenty two equipment grounding conductors. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Moving forward, we're looking at two fifty one zero two C one, as I mentioned earlier. The calculation here: when to apply the twelve and a half percent, and when not to have to apply the twelve and a half percent. Thank you, Terry Joe. Here we're talking about the main main bonding jumper again, 25102C1. Thank you. Again, we're going back here looking for a common grounding electrode conductor. Thank you. Continuing on, same, same kind of thing, 25066. So we've hit a few different chapters here, or a few different questions and based on the chapters. Uh, now we're looking uh, here on uh, the number of duplex receptacles permitted on a 20 amp circuit on a commercial location and a commercial application uh, based on 180 VA again with that. So go ahead. Thank you, Terry Joe. Moving into chapter three, uh, we're looking at the uh, minimum burial, burial depths, article uh, chapter uh, three, article uh, 300.5. Okay, uh, again, 310, Article 310, picking up some of the uh, impacities of the conductors. Thank you, Terry Joe. Here we're picking up based on ambient temperatures. Yep, thank you very, very much, Terry Joe. Again, based on ambient temperature. All right, uh, here what we've done is changed it up a little bit from copper to aluminum conductors. Um, you can see here uh, 310.15B16 uh, is referenced here. Okay, here we're looking at the load on uh, number six, again, 310.15B16. Okay, we're looking at box fill, Article uh, Article 314, uh, particularly 314.16b. Okay, again, a couple other box fill questions. Okay, here's same kind of thing now, determining uh, with the receptacle, clamps, conductors, counting the equipment grounded conductor. Again, 314. Here we're talking about uh, Article 334, the, the Romex 
and the ampacity adjustments for Romex. Okay, yep, continuing on with uh, here, we're looking at uh, the raceway uh, for your wireway, minimum size wireway based on the number of conductors and the types of conductors and size. Same thing here with a non-metallic wireway. Thank you. Uh, moving into a uh, cable tray now, talking about uh, sizing and um, for cable trays based on the certain types of conductors and cables. Thank you, Terry Joe. Moving into chapter four. <clears throat> Here we're looking at uh, a couple of motor calculations. Okay, what tables to use, where, what ta where we're using them, what we're looking to do with the different tables. We're doing conductors, ampacities. Here we're looking at the fuse size. Okay, again, another question based on uh, standard fuse size. What we've tried to do is single phase and three phase calculations here for the motors. Okay. Referencing the different tables, I think is really important here, which table to be in, you know, the, the, the either a single phase or a three phase table. Again, referencing the size of the conductors for a single phase motor here. I'm sorry, a three phase motor, single motor. Okay. Here we have it based off a single phase. Okay, here what we're looking at is uh, the sizing of different uh, conductors based off of uh, multiple motor conductors. Okay, thank you. Max, here we're looking at the overload protection. So again, referencing the, uh, the, the nameplate rating. Okay, again, based off of your motor disconnects for 30.110. Okay, again, looking at the branch size, branch circuit capacity. Okay, here we've picked up a couple of uh, fixed spa space heaters uh, with a motor on that load, determining uh, that uh, when you have the heating load as well as your motor load. Okay, overload protection using an overload relay. Okay, so you're again, you're picking up your nameplate. In this particular case, you're looking at the different scenarios between the, uh, <clears throat> the temperature rise and the service factor. All right, uh, here we're going into article 450 transformers based off the, the, the primary and secondary currents. Okay, here we're looking at primary and secondary protection. Chapter, chapter six, what we're looking at here, yep. Chapter six is uh, a little bit into the photovoltaic, just a, a few calculations based on the photovoltaic um scenarios okay i think it, terry joe if you don't mind going back one slide okay uh here what you can see here is that uh, you know in the 2017 one of the things that did change was that um, chapters one through seven now uh can modify each other here's one example where you can see that uh you know you got something in article 690 that uh you know goes back and references article 310 Okay, thank you, Terry Joe. Again, uh, you're looking in now in ch ch chapter eight. Uh, this is sizing. I think this is one thing that uh, a lot of electricians always wonder how, how to, uh, how many conductors can I get in a, a, or communication cables can I get into a conduit? Uh, and here's a couple of scenarios that'll give that to you. Thank you, Terry Joe. Again, question that gets asked a lot, how many Cat6 cables can you pull through a three quarter inch conduit? and the, the proper calculation to figure that out. Here's one with fiber. Chapter nine, uh, what we have in here is uh, again, uh, the number of conductors through a, uh, a conduit nipple uh, and based on a 20 inch length. 
Okay, here it is. Uh, what we're looking at is some motor circuits here, determining what we need for a conduit. Again, conduit sizing. Thank you, Terry Joe. And some additional calculations based on Ohm's law. And power. Voltage drop. Okay, again, a little bit with Ohm's law. Thank you, Terry Joe. You're welcome. And I believe that should just about bring us almost to the end of, of all the slides. Thank you, Terry Joe. You're very welcome. With that, I guess we will open up. I, I apologize at the beginning, uh, trying to uh, to go through the slide, more of a, 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 a teaching moment. But uh, again, I, I apologize for that. That's the instructor and in me going through that more than a, a presenter mode. <laughs> so I apologize that from the from a board member standpoint. But with that, any questions? No problem with that, Rich. Um, th and thank you, Rich, very much. Um, as Rich just said, does anybody have any questions on his presentation? see any hands up okay up oh, there's steve 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 owen yes steve, steve you're muted steve owen national code seminars birmingham alabama yep. i started to download and print some of the presentation you had the osha part printed well at six per page for handout as i tried to do the other calculations uh, the only thing you can even read is two per page and there's 140 calculations. So if you do one per page, there's 140 pages for that. But anything more than uh, two, you can't read them. So it looks like you almost have to print two per page for the uh, calculation part. Because I know you want to be able to read them and I don't want you to reject it once I send it in to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that may be that may very well be the case. Yeah, Mr. Mark Handels. Can I suggest that we just put the question slide up there and the one with the answer we don't give them and we make them do it in the class and then that just cuts out about half those pages. Mark, absolutely. I you know there's the, it's it's in there the, the answer sheets are in there for the instructors. You can absolutely hide that slide. Um, absolutely yeah i'm just trying to streamline this but i just don't want to get rejected so you know if we just give them just the the, the first slide as a whole page or even a half you know put two in there then we do the calculations i've got the answer and then i can throw it up you know in the powerpoint up on the screen and then they see it and we can move on yeah and that's that's predominantly what we're really trying to do is we we, we want this, the attendee to, to work the question Okay, at the same time, we want the instructors to have the answer and how we arrive at that answer. Um, so, and although you may not get through 100% of those in a, in a three hour period, it, it would also be nice to be able to have you uh, be able to offer to your attendee this, the answer to the questions for anything you didn't cover. Uh, Paul? Yeah, thank you, Larry. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think one of the things that we discussed was basically have it as a workbook so that the the questions that Rich had presented were in the workbook, not so much copying the PowerPoint itself to the workbook, to the handout, um, to actually do the calculations under that example. Exa exactly, Paul. That that was exactly the intent of us as a subcommittee was to, to have that as a workbook. Um, for them to figure out the calculations and the presentation was more for the providers. And then to have the answers separate from the workbook so it's not just included with it. That is correct. Correct. Maybe, maybe that just wasn't clear, clearly uh, transmitted here. Yeah, I, I might not have, uh, Mr. Chairman, I might not have cl uh, clarified that quite clear. I apologize today too. My camera's not working. 
I had that situation a week ago in a meeting too. So it was actually <laughs> mine. It was my microphone. <laughs> Everyone's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, going back to Mark Candell's question, uh, yeah, you could. Uh, they they should, you could definitely separate the two. That's not a problem, uh, even with your presentation. Uh, Thank see. you. Question. Mr. Chairman, we have um, our Boander who made a comment. He said, thanks for yeah. the hard work of the board, but um, the board put into this. I see great need for more education for our electricians on a daily basis for all aspects of the code safety and CGS. So thank you for that. And I just wanted the board to be aware that he had said that on behalf for the board. Yep, I just uh, I just picked up the same question myself. <laughs> uh, so. And we have I'm a just, hand up, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me? We have a hand up now. I believe it's Mr. Savoy. Yes, um, thank you. Yep. Just, just an FYI, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, continual training is an OSHA requirement. It, uh, these um, employers should know that anyway, and they should have it in place safety plan that is uh, whether it's daily, weekly, or monthly, they got to have a, a continuing training for their employees. That's an OSHA requirement. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else with a question at this point? Um, um, somebody had sent over a question to me during the presentation about the uh, correction to this the slide to the I think it was 110.14 uh, and it was 110.114 just have extra one in there um, yeah we can get that corrected we'll make that correction uh, George Ballard yes good afternoon um, great job on this and uh, the workbook makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, as a teacher, my pretty much uh, 31 years, you know, you, you, you've got to give them the opportunity to answer the questions, but you also want to be able to give them some type of packet that has answers with it um, so they can reference later. Um, so I'm not sure uh, as far as uh, in the handout, uh, if we want to separate those two, I think that's a great idea. Um, but it just makes a lot of sense that, you know, they, they reference a, a lot of the guys that have come to me have used the books and referenced them over the years. And it was nice to have all the information right there for them. Um, and, and I think, I think the, the board and everybody did a great job with this. Thank you. Thank, thank you, George. Appreciate that. Anybody else have any questions about any of this year's program? Because that pretty much sums up our program here and what I want to go over with all the providers. I see no more hands going up. And no more so, questions, Mr. Chairman. I have nothing else. I'm, oh, one hand, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yep, yeah. uh, Mr. Bonder. Bonder. Yeah, my question is this, do we have to, because I just finished my my um, submittal, um, ready to go out, and uh, is it is it, uh, must you make this in workbook form, or is this, um, or can we send it in uh, just as it was given to us? No, I think you need to make it a workbook, uh, to be honest with you, because it's, it, and, it, and there's a question that just came in uh, from uh, Sal, uh, a suggestion that basically we make it a workbook, and at the back of the booklet uh, we put the we uh, put the answer sheets so that when they leave the class, if everything hasn't been covered, they can at least see how to get the answer to a question that maybe they have to go back and refer to down the road. All right, so you want us as the provider to make up the workbook? Yes, the, the workbook would be in essence the, the, your handout. The handout, the handout right? Yep. 
All right. Well, I guess you might as well send the thing back that I sent you, and I'll send another one out <laughs> next week. Oh, you sent something out already? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so is, there, is everybody clear that then the, 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 the handout will be encompass the workbook, okay? And the answers will be at the back of the book as a, for reference afterwards. Everybody got that, I hope. Okay. Okay, no other questions? I don't see any more, Mr. Chairman. No more questions and no more raised hands. Okay. I will then say that uh, that will conclude our presentation. And uh, we, we, are, we should have the limited licenses ready pretty soon. That's a different crew working on that. Um, and I hope to see that right after the first of the year, actually. Uh, I don't think it'll be before the first of the year. It's a little too tight with the holidays. So anybody that's on this call that also does limited licenses, uh, that just gives you a little idea what the time frame might be. So no other questions and uh, we'll close the meeting. And uh, I thank everybody for attending and uh, we'll see you next time around. Thanks, Larry. Good.